Great sound effects. Thanks. I've been practicing yeah, with the Dix Academy. That's why there's a need button. <laughs> should have uh, ads, add effects like that so we can like really have fun with people. And this is just a quick reminder to folks that if you're not speaking, it might be a good idea to make sure that you're muted. And co-hosts have an option to mute, right? Just in case. Absolutely. I believe we can, yes. All right, David, it's 1135. Um, I'm trying to see whether we have folks who are still coming in. It looks like there may be one or two. So why don't we give it a, a 30 seconds or a minute, and then uh, we'll go ahead and get started. OK. Uh, so for folks who are here, um, I'd like to run this one very similar to the previous session. Um, and Dave has some more information about mechanics here. But um, Dave does have a lot of material presented. We want to make sure we get plenty of time for all of it to be presented. So uh, we just would ask that um, uh, if you have questions, first put them in the chat, um, and we'll try to answer them in real time. Um, we certainly would allow questions if someone wants to break in, if it's uh, important to talk about it right then. Um, uh, just raise your hand and we'll try to break in gently and recognize uh, people that way. Um, Dave, if I see someone who um, has a question raising their hand or something that ought to be addressed on a particular slide, I'll try to, to bring it to your attention so that you don't have to also monitor what's going on there. Sounds good. Yep. And at the end, we will have an open session for questions. Um, and at that time, you know, we'll, we'll basically open the mics and let folks ask Dave questions. Um, and we'll uh, make sure that uh, we try to get them all recorded. Mm -hmm. uh, and Dave, I, I thank you for putting the, the uh, Google Doc information here. This is a reminder to everybody, we do have uh, the Google Doc that we are going to be monitoring um, both now and also after the session. So uh, feel free to put any comments, any suggestions, any questions. Um, we will follow up with any of those things that we get. Uh, so um, that's also available for you if, if uh, you want to take advantage of it. And with that, I'm going to mostly turn it over to Dave here, I think. Uh, Dave Copeland is, uh, I worked with Dave for a very long time now, <laughs> back from, I think, even the 2007 kind of days. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we use our telecommunications lead. So this is something that Dave is uh, well able to, to uh, introduce and to, to teach us all about. Uh, so Dave, why don't we go ahead and, and get started? Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Dave Copeland, uh, and uh, I'm going to talk through the basic uh, downlink, uh, basic constraints we have against the science data downlink. Um, I will point out that this is actually the first of two sessions that we're going to hold. Uh, my uh, colleague Reza Astari is going to talk tomorrow about specifically the trades within the telecommunications system. There's going to be overlap, and I'm going to talk to some of that as we go through. Uh, but uh, the uh, um, Split here is going to be more uh, uh, where we're we taking a look at the overall data return versus specifically the stuff that uh, is in the, the telecommunications subsystem of the uh, mission. Uh, as Jim mentioned, um, if uh, you have questions, please raise uh, please raise your hand or put them in the chat. Um, we also have the Google Doc. The link is in the chat. Uh, and I welcome your uh, comments, recommendations, questions uh, that you can put into there. I've also put into that doc uh, some of the questions that we have. And I uh, invite you to uh, give, the, give me your opinions on those. Okay, so our fund fundamental purpose for being here uh, is setting the size of the pipe that uh, is going to be between the instrument suite and the science team. Um, and every decision that we're making here when it comes to the mission design, the spacecraft, uh, the ground systems, everything like that goes to fundamentally establishing how, how much and how quickly can we return data. Uh, this breaks down into the link capacity, just the raw data rate that we can run over the uh, downlink itself. And then secondly, a more CONOPS question of how the mission utilizes that capacity and then now turns that into a steady flow of information that is going into our science team. So uh, no matter how much we get involved in the details of the spacecraft uh, or the technology we're using, 
this is the bottom line. We are here to provide that pipe from an instrument suite that is out at range back to a science team. So talking first to the uh, link capacity questions to range. Uh, this boils down to uh, fundamentally the first equation, um, which I show a modified version over on the left, which shows us the uh, um, fundamental capacity drivers to a link. We know that uh, data rate is going to go as one over the distance squared. It is gonna go directly with transmitter output power that's available. And that's going to be set by the overall DC power that's available on the spacecraft. Uh, the factors, are including the choice of operating frequency, the choice of the spacecraft transmitting aperture, uh, these are very much intertwined. Uh, there is the um, you know, prevailing uh, uh, tendency to go higher in frequency if we want to get higher link capacity. There are limitations to that. And that is uh, very much tied into uh, the choice of transmitting aperture and fundamentally our ability to point that transmitting aperture. Um, thirdly, uh, the aperture on the ground and its performance figures into the link as well. Now, uh, uh, in uh, the talk tomorrow, uh, Dr. Astari is going to go through the uh, trades that we have in terms of uh, operating frequency, transmitting aperture, and our decisions there. So, uh, within the talk today, I'm going to be working primarily from our baseline that we've chosen uh, uh, for this study thus far. Now, given this capacity, there we go. Uh, the second part of uh, this problem is how we use that capacity. Uh, so these are now choices for which spacecraft antenna we're going to use for a particular phase. Um, which ground asset are we going to use? Now, as Jim had mentioned on Monday, uh, we are looking, uh, of course, at the DSM, but we're also looking at what apertures could we use beyond the DSM. And notionally, we are now taking a look at what if we expand into using something the size of the NGVLA. Um, then there are sheer operational concerns, uh, the pass duration that we take and the pass cadence. How often are we taking passes? Um, and then, from these, we can calculate an overall data volume over a certain time. Uh, for this analysis here, we are calculating that weekly. Um, and then from that, I can calculate an effective data rate. So this effective data rate would be essentially the rate we would uh, see where we're running this, uh, uh, basically running this 24 seven. So if we take an eight hour pass per week, at a particular data rate, then the effective data rate is going to be whatever you ran that link at uh, times the ratio of eight hours over the number of hours in the week, 168. So we actually calculate this by taking the data volume and dividing it by the seconds in a week. Okay, this is our baseline uh, telecom subsystem. This is an x band uh, design, fully redundant. Uh, based on a five meter solid composite uh, high gain being driven by a, a pair of uh, TWTAs uh, that we are counting on them uh, being one for one redundant. So a single TWTA right now is scaled to uh, run the mission. We're not counting on having to uh, run both TWTAs uh, simultaneously. We've also included an MGA. This is uh, uh, baseline right now is the, basically the uh, MGA that's on New Horizons and then a pair of LGAs for early mission use. So the uh, overall subsystem mass is driven by the size of that high gain. And this will be a subject of the trades that uh, Dr. Astari will go into uh, tomorrow, is that we see that a lot of the trades that we're looking at is not necessarily to uh, get the data rate up, but it's to keep us at a decent data rate and keep the mass down. Um, the performance that we've calculated thus far uh, at 375 AU, which is approximately that 50 year point, uh, is uh, over 2,500 bits per second. And then out at 1,000 AU, which is our second asymptote in design, we're at 365 bits per second. So we're a little bit lower than that 500 bit per second target that we initially were shooting for. Um, I'll point out that uh, we're assuming here that we're running uh, rate 1.6 turbo codes. Uh, which uh, are you know high heritage codes. We use them all the time, and they are still some of the best codes we've got uh, for uh, running these links. So, 
Um, as we've discussed, we're looking at uh, going beyond the DSN on what could we could we get the greater aperture on the ground, um, and why would we want to do this? And it comes down to that uh, those data link uh, downlink data rate targets that we're shooting for. Uh, we've got two fundamental uh, engineering goals that we're shooting for here, a mission lifetime of 50 years, and then to be able to return science all the way up to 1,000 AU. Um, that second one especially is where the need for a greater ground aperture comes into uh, play. So uh, moving beyond the DSN, uh, we're looking now at could we notionally do something that is on the, uh, essentially the NGVLA? And we're using that as our uh, um, sort of our baseline target here. So this is, you can see, providing a considerable increase in aperture that's available on the ground. You know, over 47,000 square meters compared to 2,500 square meters out of a 4 by 34 meter array of the DSN. Um, and again, in tomorrow's presentation, we'll give more details on our uh, prediction of performance for this. So by uh, employing greater aperture on the ground. Um, the benefits that that gives us is uh, several. Um, obviously, you're getting better performance. It also allows us to run this, uh, this downlink with less DC power. So it enables a more realistic transmit power on the spacecraft. In terms of complexity and technical risk, we're basically shifting uh, complexity and technical risk from the spacecraft down to the ground. If you take a look at that uh, X-band design, that is a very high heritage, high TRL design. We could pretty much build that now. Um, so uh, this is making, you know, getting us a spacecraft which has to uh, fit within 2030 uh, technology. Um, and we can easily do that. Uh, in so doing, we are taking risk on, on what we're doing on the ground. And uh, I'm not going to uh, um, sort of belittle that. There is significant uh, technical issues to be taken a look at for trying to run data through such a large uh, array. But now at least that risk is on the ground um, and it's time phased. So the spacecraft is locked in. Uh, the technology has to be chosen in, in such a way that in 2030 we're launching. Um, the ground doesn't. The ground can be time phased in its capabilities. And in fact, we'll see later in the presentation, we're on the DSN for the first 10 years of the mission. And then we can start phasing in greater aperture beyond that. So uh, there is definitely work to go in this area. Uh, we'll be touching on this in several times. Uh, what are the mechanisms for basically aperture sharing now between two, fund two different communities, uh, deep space communications and radio astronomy? We both need big apertures. Uh, so what could we be doing and what are the uh, mechanisms in which we could do this kind of sharing? Now, uplink is another concern here. Uh, we will need to talk to the spacecraft and uplink is uh, coming from the DSN. So you will always still be scheduling time on the DSN to talk to the spacecraft. Uh, one of the questions, and I'll touch on this a little bit later, is how often do we really need to be talking to the spacecraft? Uh, or how often do we need to be uplinking to the spacecraft and why? Okay, for the power available to uh, the downlink, uh, we are counting uh, on an end of life power of 300 watts coming from two RTGs, and this is at 50 years. And you can see to the right basically how that uh, PEL that Jim presented on Monday breaks down. Uh, and the science payload and the power going into the TWTAs, the power ends for the downlink, are your two biggest components to that uh, DC power, with a main, maintaining about a 28% margin overall on top of that. So that scales and fits uh, perfectly uh, within a 50-year lifetime. One of the things we now need to take a look at is going beyond 50 years, how are we gonna handle that? As you can see, as we move out in time, uh, we'll lead into the margin. What do we do when the margin is now going away? And now, uh, how do we scale back power draws within the spacecraft to uh, fit within that? And this is uh, ongoing work that we're looking at. Um, we selectively 
turning off scientific instruments to bring their consumption down uh, and trying to fit that in, uh, in that it, it doesn't make much sense to have a very high capacity downlink if we don't have that much data available to downlink. So it's a trade-off between power that's going into generating scientific data versus the power that going into downlinking that data. The other case we're taking a look at is that red line cutting through there is what do we do if one of the RTGs fail? And it's about the same conversation really uh, in that how do we now start planning on scaling back power if we have to. Uh, one of the things about uh, TWTAs is they like to run at one power. Um, there has been some work in uh, sort of multi-mode power amps that in the, uh, and this is a fertile area for technology exploration that would definitely help out a mission like this is how can we run power amps efficiently at multiple output power levels? Whether it is through combining techniques, similar to what New Horizons does with uh, polarization diversity combining, uh, or um, different amplifier, amplifier topologies that would allow us to start scaling back both that DC power going into the power amps and the science payload simultaneously so that we can keep those optimized. Okay, I want to talk more now about uh, the uh, study we have done in terms of planning out our downlinks uh, and how this would be, uh, become a concept of operations. We have uh, three phases of the mission, the inner heliosphere out to 70 AU, uh, the outer heliosphere out to 250 AU, and then beyond that's the interstellar phase of the mission. Uh, inner, the inner heliosphere includes our commissioning time, our Jupiter flyby, uh, and we're assuming that the uh, science campaign is starting after Jupiter. And as you know, the discussion we had uh, in the earlier session, uh, that's really when we can uh, deploy uh, the booms uh, and start that science campaign. So the initial assumptions we have walking into uh, laying out that CONOPS. Uh, as I had mentioned previously, we're treating this as uh, uh, characterizing the total data downlink per week. And then I'm going to take that and translate that into an effective data rate, which now can feed back into the science team as to this is the overall size of the pipe you have. Uh, we're baselining an eight hour pass. Uh, and this is you know, a, a typical assumption uh, for uh, running our missions. Uh, we have the MGA and HDA to use. Um, we're allowing mixing and using those. Um, the calculations that I'm showing here, by the way, are total rates. So I am not separating out science, housekeeping, and overhead. Uh, this is uh, uh, the effective data rate is uh, that total pipe coming down. So that has to uh, accommodate all three of those. We plan to maximize the use of the DSN. Um, our initial plan was uh, saying uh, stay on the DSN out to Pluto, and I'll show you uh, where we ended up with that. And also plan though that we would uh, stage the increase of the DSN aperture. So arraying as we can and, and arraying as we go. Um, in the uh, early portions of the mission, we want to maximize the use of that MGA because we can allow a greater pointing error with the MGA. Uh, we can have a pointing error up to 2.7 degrees on that MGA uh, versus with the HGA that has to be 0.2 degrees or less. So this allows us uh, to uh, reduce the amount of times that we're actually having to adjust that pointing vector back to Earth. Um, I am assuming that uh, we are nominally Earth pointed on the aft. You know, we're pointing the antennas back to Earth. We're not. Uh, there is a small portion where we consider it sun pointed, and that's really just for the uh, initial phase of the mission. Uh, I've not quantized the data rates yet, and this is a step that we would typically take phase A, phase B in the mission. Uh, so right now we'll show basically that the uh, data rates are infinitely variable. Um, this analysis also, by the way, is based on Wayne's option 1A, assuming an 860 kilogram uh, spacecraft. So, um, Mapping this uh, out to those three phases of the mission. Uh, the LEOP 
really only extends for the first 100 days. Inner heliosphere out to 70 AU, uh, counting on using the MGA out to Jupiter, uh, then starting the science collection after Jupiter and then switching over to the HDA at, the, at that point. Uh, and this is what that first uh, session uh, section looks like. So coming out of launch, you're on the LGAs for 100 days. Uh, and we have credible return uh, operation during that time period. Uh, so beyond that, we're proposing we'll stay on the MGA, do three passes a week, and staying on the 34 meter dish, single a single 34 meter dish. One thing to take a look at here is uh, for any any kind of uh, collection we need to do during this time period, uh, you might actually be doing better to just do one single burst through the high gain than you would going uh, through the uh, uh, MGA. And this quickly raised a question we need to go back and take a look at. Is the MGA worth its own mass? And this is something to take a look at, um, especially since science collection really is, is not starting until after Jupiter. So this is still fundamentally a commissioning phase of the mission. And that Jupiter flyby, as you can see, is happening 299 days after launch. Okay, going into the inner heliosphere portion of the mission now. So the MGA quickly becomes unfeasible. Uh, and we have to uh, switch over the high gain for staying on the DSN. And as I said, we're trying to maximize time that, we're, uh, that we are staying on the DSN. So we're counting on switching over to the high gain, staying at three passes per week. Um, now, following the uh, um, uh, phasing of array capability within the DSN, we basically, we picked a point, a data rate of 10 kilobits per second. So we will now step up the array size to try to keep us above that point, but nonetheless stay on the DSN. And we're able to hold uh, a pretty decent data rate through this, this time period, all the way out to uh, launch plus 10 years, which is when we're hitting essentially that 70 AU point. Uh, so, through that entire heliosphere phase, we're staying on the DSN. Extending out beyond that, when we're now making the assumption that we're going to jump to the NGVLA or you know, using the NGLA as a now a notional array capability. Now, where we stand in the study at this point, we've made the assumption that we're just going to do a wholesale jump. And this is uh, something that really warrants further investigation is how that jump really needs to look. Uh, do we want to phase in uh, its use uh, through you know, smaller array capability uh, and then step up to a full array? Um, or uh, is it better to basically go to the higher aperture and just take fewer passes? And that's the approach that we've taken uh, right now where in, during that inner, uh, that outer heliosphere phase, we're just going to drop back and say we're going to talk to the spacecraft uh, once every two weeks. Um, you've, in, in moving to the higher aperture, you've now gone to a ten, uh, 10 times jump in the raw data rate. So we can cut back on the number of passes that we're going to take. Um, now, at this point, we've sort of run out of knobs to turn other than the number of passes we're taking or the length of each pass. So as we're moving out to the uh, interstellar phase to maintain the overall capacity, uh, we then are assuming that we're going up to a pass per week. So I think you know, these assumptions we can use as um, sort of going in pos uh, position to a negotiation because this gives an overall size of that effective data rate pipe. Uh, that we need to then take a look at uh, comparing to the amount of science we're getting back um, and have we scaled these properly. So uh, this uh, is a, a chart that we presented on Monday, um, which basically summarizes those assumptions. From this, we can calculate the overall data volume that's coming down on a weekly basis. And from that, we can calculate that effective data rate, which is just taking that overall data volume and dividing it by the time of the week. And you end up with a picture that looks like this. Uh, so you can see the different steps as we're switching uh, up capabilities uh, throughout the mission. You can 
barely see uh, the time on the MGA. So almost all this, you're on the HDA. And then what you're fundamentally seeing is now stepping up that capability on the ground to uh, keep that overall effective uh, data rate return up. Out at 50 years, uh, we're predicting that that effective data rate now is 138 bits per second, which is, uh, again, that is running a link at about, for this particular trajectory, it comes out to about 2,900 bits per second, running that link eight hours uh, per week. So one pass per week. And then we can uh, extend that on out. If we can maintain that performance all the way out to 1,000 AU, you uh, the, uh, get the curve on the right, and you can see that we're just under 20 bits per second. Now, one question that has come up is, what if we were to not switch off the DSN? If we were to run this just with, just with DSN assets, and we can run that simulation. Uh, so I went back and ran this, assuming that the largest aperture we make available to us is a current DSN capability, which is four 34 meter dishes arrayed together. And if we keep this at three passes per week, uh, my apologies to the GNC team for making them point the spacecraft three passes per week for 50 years. Um, that's going to have a significant impact on the spacecraft. But if we can do that, where do we end up? And you can see that uh, you know, now we're at a uh, effective data rate out of 50 years of 23 bits per second. So you, you can see a significant hit uh, in that drop in aperture and you're making up for it partially by a, uh, you know, simply bringing data down more often and tying up an asset quite a bit, uh, tying up the majority of a, uh, uh, DSN complex three times a week for this. So, um, you know, overall, this can be done. The pipe will definitely be smaller. Uh, so, there is a real advantage here that if we can pursue now moving beyond uh, into a, a greater aperture availability on the ground. So, open questions that we're looking at. You know, this and this entire concept now of moving to non-DSN assets on the ground uh, has obvious advantages to be able to get to higher aperture, but there's risks involved in this, uh, both technical, logistical, operational. You know, what are going to be the benefits and the barriers to actually being able to share this kind of ca capability between the two communities? Um, is there really institutional motivation for doing this kind of collaboration? Uh, it would certainly help us out. Um, what's the best way that we could face this in over time? Um, and trading this against the science return, is that DSN only option actually viable? Uh, if this really is falling in, falling below what uh, is a minimum threshold for science return, then no, we have got to go to a larger aperture. Um, as I mentioned before, we're taking a look at the MGA. Uh, it really is just buying new stuff for that first year. And it allows you to not uh, adjust the pointing vector of the spacecraft uh, as often. Um, but is it worth its own mass? Uh, that's an interesting trade that I think we need to take a look at. Um, and then uh, uh, what do we do with uplink? Uplink and radiometrics. So typically, we're also running Doppler and ranging. And we absolutely will be doing this while we're within the solar system, uh, especially uh, up to the uh, Jupiter gravity assist. What do we need to be doing beyond that? Really, how often do we need to be doing radiometric measurements to maintain a navigation solution for this mission? And beyond that, how often do we really need to be uplinking? Could we actually do a downlinking mostly mission? So uh, these are questions that are still ahead of us. And uh, that is what I have. So uh, I, I welcome your questions and comments. Okay, thanks, Dave. Um, before we open it up for general discussion, I do want to just sort of recap what we've got in the chat. Um, one of the things that Alan Stern has asked is um, the question of um, <clears throat> why not look at a far larger HGA in active or closed loop earth pointing? Um, the latter could be RF or optical. So mm -hmm. I know we're going to cover 
some of these trades uh, in tomorrow's discussion, but do you want to give us a little bit of a taste of that? Sure. Um, and, yeah, and the answer is we are looking at active uh, uh, pointing. Um, and uh, Reza, I apologize, I might be stealing a bit of your uh, presentation here, uh, in that uh, it makes no sense to use an aperture larger than your ability to point that beam width back to Earth. That's always going to be the trade-off. So uh, we can go to a larger aperture, we can look at alternative technologies for bringing the mass down of that, and we can take a look at going higher in frequency uh, to better exploit that aperture, all of which are going to require now bringing the pointing control back into the subsystem itself. So you're doing some form of secondary steering of that beam. Um, with this baseline solution, we are assuming the spacecraft is pointing the antenna, just as we have done on you know, spacecraft such as uh, New Horizons. So this is the, uh, the sort of low risk, low spacecraft risk, high heritage approach. Um, but you know, absolutely, uh, this is something that we're looking at and it's on the table. Okay, thanks. Um, so another discussion we've been having over on the chat is about the NGVLA and uh, sort of what is the interaction you've had with them and, and how do we know that uh, that we'll get support for what we're going to need here? Um, we don't yet know really that we will get support and this is something we need to be working on uh, and something we will be working on going forward. The uh, uh, We've had initial conversations into that community um, and uh, also looking, you know, technically as to, you know, will this fit into what we are doing? Um, this is an array that's not designed necessarily to do comps. So uh, we have to take a look at, you know, it's uh, what technically is involved in its dual use here. Um, so yes, I think this very much feeds into the questions that we need to be, uh, that we are planning on be working on now is what, What's the logistics of that kind of cooperation? Okay. Um, I would just note uh, that um, that uh, Alan uh, has offered to help with some of the contacts and making making that uh, contact with the all uh, for it. NSF and so forth. So I've I've happily accepted his help. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, let's see. I do have one question for Pontus. Um, Pontus, are you are you there? Yes, I am. Okay, great. Uh, so Dave is pretending here the, the weekly uh, data volume uh, numbers, the numbers uh, per week. And I just wanted to uh, just make sure that we're touching base, uh, that uh, everybody on the science team understands how to interpret that chart. Um, and as you're going forward with, uh, so for instance, instrument planning, um, you folks know how to, how, to, how to use that data. Because not yeah. now is your chance for clarification. Yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, to me, it's clear. And thank you, thank you, David, David for making, mm -hmm. you know, to construct the bucket in such a kind of concrete way. Um, so to me, it's clear, but uh, I'm going to post a question to others online. I see Peter Coleman is here, and he's, he's very familiar with this because he constructed the, the data vol volume allocation tape circulated around the, um, uh, the, uh, the working group leads. But if there are other working group leads or topical group leads that have questions or scientists, this is your time. I interpret okay. that as, as it is crystal clear. We do, have a, right. we do have a raised hand. Oh, we do. I'm sorry, Alan, go ahead. Okay, uh, thanks, Jim. Yeah, I heard, uh, first of all, really impressive uh, presentation, Dave. Thank you. For it. Um, toward the very end, you, you asked the rhetorical question about whether this could be more or less a downlink only mission, mm -hmm. or at least at very large heliocentric distances. Sorry not to have my camera on. Uh, uh, I would tell you our experience, and I think the Voyager experience is similar, that simply handling the inevitable anomalies right. uh, uh, really mit mitigates against that. And I think it would be a mistake to consider a downlink only mission. Mm -hmm. You need to have the capability to, to fix what the spacecraft autonomy system might not be able to mm -hmm. um, at any distance that you care about being able to operate. Right. It takes a very long time. If it took a year to fix a problem, when you've still got 10 years of mission life, 
um, I think it'd be worth it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, and you know, it I cannot possibly imagine getting to a point where you're truly down Lagoma uh, for any mission. But could we cut back to once a month downlinks? Uh, and what's truly driving that is, you know, can we plan out command loads in such a way that, uh, yes, you could just be sending them once a month and be getting once a month radiometric data. So I'll tell you on New Absolutely. Horizons, we went as long as seven months in hibernation. And right. had we had a requirement to do it, we could have designed hibernation uh, that also provided downlink during hibernation. Mm -hmm. that, a different kind of hibernation. Right. And, and that parallel is a very good one to take a look at. I mean, a lot of what this mission is doing, it's kind of like being in hibernation, but you're still running the science instruments. Which we did after we put the appropriate hooks in in 2009 in flight. <laughs> we, we recorded data on the SSR right. um, from four, three crew science instruments, not four, but three crew science instruments during hibernations ever since, uh, but we had to buffer that data until we were back in one of the active spin or three axis modes uh, to get it to the ground. Right. But there's no physics that prevents a hibernation from also being able to download. Correct. So uh, we have ongoing conversations with the uh, New Horizons operations to, to get a better feel of you know, how could, you know, what can we learn from that New Horizons experience to bring it in here and now map that into how we would be running this mission? Okay. Great. Okay, so Dave, we have a question from um, Kate Kufal from the chat. Um, it says, for farther distances up to 1,000 AU where the data rate becomes very low, is it possible mm -hmm. to array 34 meter dishes instead of four? Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about what is possible with arraying? Um, Theoretically, yes, uh, if the dishes are available, or if at the very least the dishes all have uh, um, simultaneous view of the spacecraft. Um, the, I'm using four mainly because it is a, you know, a, a common number we are using now for uh, DSN capability. Um, if the, uh, it, and this also figures into, uh, I guess, upcoming discussions now with the DSN is, how well, can, how can they predict uh, what apertures they could have available to us in 50 years? Um, if they build more 34s, I'm all for arraying them. Um, it is also possible, and things we've taken a look at for other missions, that you are array, uh, using uh, both DSN and non-DSN assets. Um, I, uh, I have curves that include the 70 meters. When it came to doing the, the long-term calculations, we did not take the 70 meters into account. Uh, but if they were there, then you take a look at can you array you know, 434s plus a 70, which should give you on the order of the performance of 270s. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, am, I personally am a proponent for arraying every dish that can see the spacecraft. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, so Bill uh, Kurth, I think you got your hand up. Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, Dave, if you allow me to just add to that, uh, DSN is capable of tying in six with its current capabilities, but expendable mm -hmm. to eight. But of course, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, it's, the, it's based on the available apertures, preferably co-located with, um, within proximity of each other. Right. Um, I mean, right now, I think the only place you could get close to that, and someone please correct me if I'm wrong, is probably Goldstone. And there you could probably end up with a, uh, an interesting heterogeneous mixture of dishes uh, all arrayed together. Sounds good. Okay, an go. interesting uh, couple to that uh, point is that the trajectory asymptotes declination ties into which DSN antennas complexes you can use. Yes. You go yes. south to do the space physics for whatever reason, then you're going to be stuck with Canberra. Right. You know, and Voyager, I think, is currently, at least Voyager 2, uh, I'm not sure if it's Voyager 1 or 2, actually, but one of the two Voyagers is Canberra only at this point. Yeah. If you go north, then you have probably two stations that can, that can help you. Yep. And this is uh, an additional problem when we take a look you know, at, the, at the idea of using the NGVLA. Same thing. If you go south, you can lock out the NGVLA. Exactly. Yeah, and I think that's a definitely an important point to consider. All right, Bill, you've been very patient, so if you'd like to jump in. 
Oh, well, I was, I was gonna, originally going to make a comment uh, with respect to Alan's comment about Donlink only. Another very important uh, thing that we have to remember on this mission that's going to be uh, so long lived is that we will learn along the way how to better operate our instruments and how to better process data on board. Um, you haven't mentioned the capability of onboard processing to effectively increase the downlink of the spacecraft. Mm -hmm. And that capability will increase with time as we get smarter on the ground, reprogramming instruments, reprogramming computers. Uh, so I, I, I think we have to um, keep the ability to uh, improve the smarts on board. Uh, Agreed. That's one thing. Uh, I should also say that it's Voyager 2 that can only use Canberra. Um, and Voyager 1 currently is using a five station array for high rate downlinks. Mm -hmm. uh, that's 170 and 434s. Um, Voyager also has used the VLA uh, and has used parks. I don't think they've ever tried to array parks with uh, Canberra, however. Mm -hmm. The, uh, you know, which would be a fascinating experiment to run. Uh, you know, bringing something like parts or bringing in the ESA dishes or, uh, you know, something like the GBT as well. Um, you you so. know, we are, we are funding through this study some exploration of compressing certain types of science data, right. as well as onboard uh, selection of good data versus not good data, let's say. And um, uh, that's a part of the trade space here is how much intelligence do we push on board and uh, how long can we trust a computer that's powerful enough to be that smart. <laughs> and, you know, and to the point in terms of, uh, you know, operation, how, one of the things that we have to have that uplink for is there is absolutely no way when we launch that we'll be able to uh, get it right, or at least get it totally right. You're going to want to uh, adjust as you learn. If I may, uh, one person's noise is another person's data. And one of the lessons yeah. of on New Horizons is that serendipitous discoveries got made, even in the case of Voyager, decades later, in mm -hmm. data that had just been sitting around that no one had thought to look at a certain way or had a reason to examine. A, a good right. example, discovery of satellites in uh, the Uranus and Neptune systems. Uh, that happened 20, 25 years after the flybys by people who went back with data, better data processing. So I'd be very careful about, about the editing strategy um, as, as a way out because it can end up um, you know, shooting your foot off. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think we're considering an editing strategy so much as perhaps a prioritization strategy. And Obviously, there's no strategy in place yet, but it's it, uh, most of the things we've considered so far have been along the lines of data compression rather than um, rather than making choices. So a, a more conservative approach, perhaps, to uh, getting your data down in a in a compressed kind of way, rather than right. rather than uh, limiting what data you you downlink. Uh, and I think there's definitely no talk of removing data or anything like that. Um, right. Well, like right now, we're sending home a lot of dark sky data around the KBO Arakoff, even though we haven't found satellites there yet, because someone might in the future. So those pixels aren't even on the target, but we consider them to be part of the archive. And that's going to take another year to get all that on the ground. Right, exactly. So it, at, at this point in time where it's easy to fly a, a pretty large, you know, many terabytes of, of storage. It, it, it would, if there was even any kind of selection as to what's being selected down, and it, it, would, it, it would be a selection rather than a removal. And an, another good way I've heard some people talk about it is that you either have scientists choosing what to bring down or you have an algorithm that they design choosing what to bring down. But no matter what, don't fool yourself into thinking it's anything beyond a choice. Someone's making a choice. It's, it's just a matter of who you want making that choice and how. Totally agree. And if you're going to fly two transmitters, uh, the, the dual polarization strategy 
mm-hmm. going to take advantage of uh, because as long as you have both working uh, and you have the power to do it, um, you can just have more throughput. Right. You know, and that an interesting uh, segue, uh, segue there is you taking a look at that DC power curve. Uh, we're designing to that end of the lo- end of life point, which means that before that end of the life point, we have a lot of margin. How can we best exploit that margin? You know, that that is a currency for the mission to spend. How do we spend it? Um, the uh, that the design is assuming uh, it, very similar to what New Horizons did. You're maintaining two paths all the way through, uh, all the way out to free space, basically. So you could turn on both TWTAs if you have the extra power. Um, this is also something we're trying to consider. You know. Uh, if we have to deal with a failed RTG case, or a, you know, trying to really eke out the most performance you can out to distance uh, beyond 50 years, uh, is it viable uh, or preferable to actually design so, so that you are counting on having both TWTAs on at some point? Um, and then your fallback position is you cut the data rate in half and turn one of the TWTAs off. Or fly three. Yes, the problem is combining them. <laughs> you know? but they all have to all be on. Right. right. Correct. Um, it's. Uh, uh, you can fly cold spare. Um, yes, you can, and just and basically switch it in. Yeah. Um, pol- the the polarization uh, diversity arrangement is a a very easy way to get two amplifiers in play. Yep. Point, uh, you know, the antenna is going to be improving, right? To these 50 years or so on. Mm-hmm. Um, more and more people have been working with them already. Um, have you thought about it? Like, okay, if you're going to have like this Cherenkov telescope array that they're talking about, that's going to have, I don't know how many antennas in all the sizes. And, you know, like obviously going to have much better antennas and uh, mm-hmm. better adaptive optics. And so, could that help us getting, you know, farther and farther away and lose, you know, wasting less power? Um, possibly. And this is, uh, in some ways, this will be things to take a look at as uh, ways that your capability could grow, especially after launch. Um, the, uh, um, the baseline mission, the, uh, has to work with the technology we have. We we feel we will have available at least on the spacecraft by 2030, and with a viable path for um, development on the ground. You know, in some ways, what we're laying out here is a roadmap for beyond launch. How do we want the ground assets to grow? Um, so, uh, you know. These other efforts, yes, could tie in. Um, now, I think, uh, Gloria, some of those um, assets that you mentioned are optical, right? Sorry. So, Sorry. Uh, some, uh, they modify to be optics, but also yeah. RF, I think. Does that make right. sense? Um, the, uh, we are looking at an optical solution uh, and trying to assess its viability. It is the ultimate in now having to bring the pointing directly into the subsystem. There's no way the spacecraft can point your beam. Uh, the subsystem is going to have to do that on its own. It's going to have to do it to a considerably tighter amount. So it's, that then gets back into the trade-off. How is that mechanism going to work for 50 years or longer? So. All right, well, we still have about oh, uh, 20, 25 minutes left in the session. So uh, by all means, please jump in with more questions or comments or suggestions. Um, we're happy to hear everything we can. Uh, Dave, this is Ralph. Is that optical discussion part of our Res's talk tomorrow? Um, actually, Res, I'll let you speak to how much, because uh, I, I know we have a, we have the start of a concept. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So because our baseline design is TR, the highest TRL design that we can have, um, we went with this 0.2 degree pointing error spacecraft pointed 
five meter aperture X-band design. Um, we have other higher frequency, more complex trades that we've looked at, like bumping up to KA band or maybe even optical. But like Dave mentioned, you're really taking on a lot of risk based on the current TRL levels. Um, and based on the different technologies available, I'll go into the details of what kind of pointing error we're looking at for those potential KA band or optical designs. Thank you. Yeah, uh, couple, thought... Coupled with that is the fact that the uh, the discussion we've been having about RF ground infrastructure to support this mission is amplified if you step into optical. Nobody yeah. has plans to build enough of an optical array on the ground for us to support this right now. Mm -hmm. That would have to be a parallel infrastructure effort that we'd have to kick off just to support the mission. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there are optical uh, ground stations that have been used for, uh, you know, flights to date, but with nowhere near the operational lifetime or operational uh, maturity of RF systems. That's for sure. Um, it's possible. And NASA has been committed to moving to optical for uh, um, space missions wherever possible. Um, where it, whether it makes sense here I, is still very much, I think, to be proven, um, especially if we're trying to maintain, you know, that mid to high TRL level. Um, there is uh, there is optical experience in space, there's optical experience in deep space, not necessarily going to map to this particular application. Now, one thing I think is interesting to take a look at the different options is that the overall data rates that we're looking at are still all within a family. Um, I think we've got a uh, Reza, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think that all of our options right now are within about 2 dB of each other. Um, yeah. So what you're really trading off here is can you gain back mass um, by, uh, by adding additional complexity to the subsystem? You know, what can you do to bring down? Fundamentally, it's that mass of that 5-meter antenna. Um, so all of this needs to be viewed in light of the overall uh, gains to the mission itself. If the data rate is good, get the mass down. So one thing I'd like to point out too um, is the tighter the pointing constraints, the more any type of anomaly on the spacecraft has an ability to kill the mission. Yeah. Um, and what I mean by that is we were talking a little bit about, well, what happens if a wire boom has a small anomaly or what happens if X? And if you're trying to have to try to point an antenna to talk to the spacecraft to within a few hundred micro radians for it to work or else you have no communications with the spacecraft, it gets very easy for you to have a loss of communications and never hear from the spacecraft again. Right. Um, a benefit of X-Band is it allows you to have a more gradual roll off in data rates so that you can see carrier signals if there is an anomalous situation. Um, and so you can recover your spacecraft. So. Right. Hey, so one thing to think about is the mass and cost trade of having a basic capability that's, that's X band, and, but a nominal capability that's more sophisticated. So you always got a lifeline back to earth with a, mm -hmm. with a system that's much easier to point. Mm -hmm. It's the equivalent of why you fly an LGA for launch, but then you carry his dead mass the rest of the mission. Right. Um, it, there are many, several cases I've often wondered if we could just somehow jettison the LGAs at some point. Um, the, uh, <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> and at that point, you've already got stored mass. So that's kind of, <laughs> you want the inertias at that point. Right. Um, you know, the, to this point, you know, this is, okay, this is another consideration for optical. You will never fly just an optical downwind. You're always going to have also an RF capability on that spacecraft. You still have to have the capability to handle your safing modes and uh, your lee up into mission. Um, this is also, you know, a consideration where I was talking about, is the MGA worth its own mass within a nominal uh, operation? Maybe not, but it's the antenna you're going to go to if 
you have an anomaly and now you can only point the spacecraft to within two degrees of Earth as opposed to point two. Um, you know, it's analogous to the Galileo situation. It takes a while to ring a spacecraft out and to really turn the knobs down to, to get everything performing well. It is very nice early on to have that extra margin. So yeah. you, as you are learning your system and you are getting a better characterization of it, you've got that margin. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Agreed. Um, you know, you see this to a lesser extent, even at KA band, like, you know, for solar probe, it's a dual system, uh, XKA. Um, where we're just counting on the K for the high speed downlink. Um, I've often wondered and put it out as a challenge to the, uh, my colleagues, could you come up with a KA only mission that really answers all the things that the telecom system has to do? Um, for this particular mission, you probably could actually. You could, you know, what you run in, into is any link that is, um, uh, constrained by a pointing uh, constraint, such as the 0.2 degrees, or is constrained by pattern of the antenna, is always going to end up favoring a lower frequency because the secondary effects in the link. Um, and this is why for a KA mission, you typically are also flying an X system to go along with it, other than the fact that the uplink is at X. Um, for this particular mission, you head it straight out, you might be able to do something that is X up, KA down, with no X down, um, and just live with the penalty that you're putting onto your safety modes and things like that. Um, yeah. Optical, I can't, I can't see it. I would love to see someone show that it's possible. So Dave, one thing that uh, I can't remember whether you covered in your presentation, but maybe you did. Um, so the data rates that we're looking at here, the data return that we're looking at here, how does that compare to the Voyagers? Uh, let's see, Voyager, Ralph. You so know, I'll actually have some material. Per second. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Res, yeah, go ahead. I, I'll have those slides tomorrow that provide the direct comparisons to New Horizons and Voyagers performances. Yeah, yeah. Good. To it. Voyager does 1.4 kilobits per second with uh, the five uh, dish array that we talked about, and it's just barely able to keep that signal up. Mm -hmm. yep. And that's at 120 AU? 145. 145 AU, okay. So, you know, in comparison, it, uh, into the NGVLA we're predicting now, uh, 26, about 2,600 bits per second um, okay. out at um, 375 AU. Okay. okay. And uh, uh, Ray, as you said, you'll have more details tomorrow, so we'll have a good discussion about that. Yeah. And Bill, I might follow up with you offline if that's okay, because the documented performance that I see for uh, Voyager is about 160 bits per second. Uh, that's the standard data rate, and they use uh, 234s or a 70 uh, for that. Mm -hmm. But we have we have a still have a digital tape recorder on board that we dump uh, a few times a year, and uh, that mode requires uh, 1.4 kilobits per second. Yeah, that the stats I have are for just a single 70 for download. Yeah. Um, can't do it. It takes a single 70 plus four 34s. Yeah, that hey, makes sense. Hey, yeah. hey, Bill, this is Ralph. So how are they getting it up to the, the, the 1.4 to get the uh, digital tape recorder down? Um, they drop every, they drop uh, four out of five lines okay. from an image. Yeah. So <clears throat> four fifths of the data goes onto the floor while you're sending down uh, the, the one fifth. Okay. 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 We've got about uh, four minutes left, I think. Uh, Fifteen minutes left in the session. Um, are there any more questions or discussions that we want to have here? All right. So Kate's asking: At very far distances, how does the position become less certain? And if so, does that affect the pointing capability? 
So I think this is also touching on some of the comments we, some of the discussion we had on navigation um, and just knowing where we are in space uh, in the last session, right? Um, it certainly is an issue and we're, we're even still struggling with um, understanding what our capability is and what our, what our ability will be um, to navigate. Um, so knowing where you are means you can point back to Earth and we, we know that those uncertainties are definitely gonna grow. Um, we've had a number of discussions about how do you do um, some of the some of the navigation kinds of measurements uh, whenever round trip light times are on order of days, right? And so that's that is going to become a big issue. Right. Hey Jim, it may it, it, it may be even just for, worth reminding everybody that of course this plays in in a in a non in a non subtle way into the whole uh, longevity issue that uh, they were talking about at the beginning, and uh, it's sort of the convergence of those that makes this for being a perfect storm. So I'm, I'm really hoping that everybody that is uh, certainly on here today is going to be able to keep l listening in on all these engineering discussions because these really are important. And, you know, I think I think it really does illustrate what's, what some of the intrinsic difficulties are in, in doing doing this mission that people are not used to thinking about. Mm -hmm. Dave, yeah, um, and there's, uh, no, you go ahead, Dave. Yep. Okay. Let's say, you know, there are other considerations into that. Uh, um, and this is something we've been struggling with, as I was saying, is that uh, how often do we need to be doing measurements and what measurements do we need to be doing to feed into a navigation solution here? Um, we are used to being able to do two-way Doppler and ranging to our spacecraft. Uh, ranging is harder <laughs> going into an array. Uh, we just found that out on space, uh, Solar Probe. Um, it's going to be even worse if your downlink station is now the NGVLA, and uh, someone is going, some institution will need to have to develop how does one range into that many dishes? Is that even possible? So. Uh, I would hope that, you know, well, the other thing to take a look at is could we live on nothing but two-way Doppler and Delta Door? Um, or is there fundamentally new ways that we do our navigation product products that need to be investigated here for, you know, a mission that is out that far? It's a new area. Okay, anything else? All right, so Michael, um, sounds like we're, our discussion here is winding down a little bit early. Uh, did you want to see if we can uh, call the session a little bit early and give people a little bit longer break? Or what would you like to do? Michael Paul, are you there? I think he left the station. Uh, looks that way. All right, well, um, like I said before, last chance. Um, you know, please jump in if you got uh, any other questions. Um, Andrea, you look, you look like you maybe wanted to respond. No, I was just being supportive. <laughs> okay, <laughs> appreciate that. Appreciate that, yeah. <laughs> Maybe worthwhile uh, reminding Red uh, of your presentation tomorrow when it is. Uh, yeah, I believe uh, the talk that we're going to be doing on the communications trade space is tomorrow at ten ten, um, right. and it should be the same virtual room number two. Um, so hopefully, I'll see most of you people there. Okay. Okay. And so by way of wrap up, um, thank you, Pontus. This is perfect lead in. Um, we do have two more sessions on the engineering topics today. Um, at one. At one o'clock, uh, we're going to start the engineering topical area called longevity. And as Ralph has pointed out, there are a number of aspects of this. It's not just associated with uh, things like uh, keeping a team going and things like that, but there are also um, some very serious um, issues associated with the, the actual spacecraft itself that we need to worry about. Um, and then we'll be following that at, uh, looks like, uh, 225 um, with a, a discussion of reliability and some of the reliability analyses that we're doing um, and just showing the, the process we're going through to, to demonstrate that we actually can build a mission that will last for, for 50 years. 
Uh, tomorrow, we're going to have the communications trades at 1010, as we talked about. And then uh, we have a session called Uber Maneuver Concerns. And mostly that's going to be uh, just a few minutes of lead in, followed by a report from Doug Mihok on some of the uh, materials work that the study has been funding um, as an attempt to, to provide us inputs with uh, um, the ability to understand what a shield mass will be and things like that for a real uh, Oberth maneuver. Um, and again, I want to just uh, remind folks that we do have the Google Docs that will um, be available not just during the session, but um, through the whole uh, uh, workshop here and even afterwards. Um, and I think that uh, one of the things that we had talked about um, sort of behind the scenes is Andrea is going to be sending out those links again um, with the, the normal announcements for the daily uh, uh, session lists and things. Um, and again, uh, I would encourage you to go to those Google Docs, um, comment, suggest, criticize, all of those good things, because we're going to keep an eye on those and we're going to try to use those as a way to, to communicate um, back to the team, you know, the, the good ideas that people have and the good questions that they have and the, you know, the, the places where people are worried. Um, so with that, uh, thanks, Dave. I appreciate the session. Um, and I'm looking forward to uh, raise a session tomorrow, too. I think it's going to, these two together are going to be very nice. Um, way to, to really understand uh, how it is that we're going to communicate with the spacecraft. All right. Um, and with that, I think we'll adjourn for the next 20 minutes and we'll meet you, uh, I think, back in this same room, if I remember right, uh, for the longevity. Longevity is actually in a separate room. It's in room it's three. Okay. Well, trust Sorry. Andrea. She's going to plan all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, folks. Sounds good. So I'm going to stay here, Andrea, until everybody else goes so that I can stop the recording. Is that is that fair? And then, and then we'll go from there. Good. Okay. okay. All right. Thank Thanks you. All. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye now. And the key is we'll find out whether Michael's really there or not, because if he doesn't go away, we'll know he's not. <laughs> I think that if you end the meeting, it'll start processing the recording on his end. Ah, that's right. He is recording, isn't he? Yes. Okay, well, we can just go ahead and end the meeting then I think at this point, right? Yep. Should be no issue with that. All right, mm -hmm. see everybody later. <laughs>